Growing up in the modern world, you'll inevitably come across the idea of class. From the most politically motivated boomer to the tippity top of wretched Fortran Della's Weekly, my favourite magazine. The term will have likely thrown discord among us, whether it's in movies and games that use the term as some vague premise that chauffeurs a plot like it's an Indonesian politician, or Dust Capital by Karl Marx, which upon reading is not discernible from a year 12 mathematics application textbook beyond talking a lot more about codes instead of an unreasonably high watermelon purchases. Oh, public school math teachers teaching Marxism to students confirm. <laughs> How class is typically described is you have people divided into upper, middle and lower strata. The upper class is full of rich people like business owners and other moguls who own a majority of the world's wealth. The middle class typically has highly specialised professionals like doctors and lawyers and in countries like Australia can even involve what's called a working middle class of tradies and other high quality dairy munchers, bravely putting their health unnecessarily at risk, living off a mega diet of tobacco and shocky milk. What patriots. Finally, you have the lower classes, full of general skilled labourers along with the unemployed and unwashed masses. That is, druggos and discord moderators. Uh, join my Discord by the way, link in the description. Now, although these classes can be interpreted as present in most every part of the world, unless, God forbid, there's another Spanish Civil War, their details can differ from place to place. Now, to play both sides here, if you are a pinko loony lefty communist, then watch this video so that you can best understand the international class struggle, comrade. If you're a neo-fascist crypto-capitalist Patrick Joker Sigma Pill Bateman, then these are the enemies and allies of free enterprise business partner, Yeehaw! Here's the class structure and description of rural and remote Australia. Hanky dinky day, boys. The elite class, pub owners. To start at the top, because that's where the fish and chip shop rots, we have business owners. Every pub, cafe and non-franchised institution is run by a dedicated didgeridong head hard at work trying to grift as much money out of minimum wage workers who are honestly too high to notice, so fair enough. This is much like any other business owner out there. However, due to their proximity to the plebs in the lower classes through having to sometimes directly manage the poor and live in the same suburb as the middle class, the only way they can get their sense of superiority while under that stress of managing most likely the centre of economic activity in the town generic underscore pub underscore o2 or of course the perimeter defence random underscore roadhouse underscore o1 is social manipulation of the entire workforce and the purchasing of either extremely out of place Tesla cars or dysfunctional functionally sized American car. If they have some semblance of integration with the local community, they'll own a really kitted out Land Cruiser, which they probably only ever use to drive to a local creek that barely even needs four wheel drive access. Land Cruisers are the main status symbol in the Australian country, at least when it comes to wealth. When it comes to health, it's whether you still have all your natural teeth. That's right, ladies, I'm healthy. When it comes to where the upper crust lives, well, it's like a volcano, really. Where in the cities, that'd be divided by massive suburbs on the coast or along the river with fancy names like Peppermint Grove or Defence Housing Authority. In rural Australia, that such suburb barely exists and often has to be shared with the wealthier middle class. In remote Australia where populations can drop as low as 500, the fancy houses are either the roadhouses that the rich person owns or a house right next to the shopping centre. In bigger towns like Geraldton, it still has some kind of rich person suburb, however it does have to be shared with those country equestrians. Located just two kilometres from the nearest and only shopping centre, this suburb of Geraldton is the prime real estate of the town. Enjoy one of the only places with two-storey buildings. Quite luxury. Enjoy the untainted luxury of living right in front of this endless ocean. The nearest landmass will be South Africa, so for any of you equine folks out there, why don't you ride your beautiful horse into the ocean? Do it. Ride your horse into the ocean, never to return. Ride it. Ride it. 
Glide it, glide it into the ocean, never to be seen. Into the ocean, never to be seen. Location, location. Sailing houses, Australia. Ultimately, the upper class of rural Australia presents a very limited arrangement of people and are vastly overshadowed by the massive companies that, through employment, are the only thing really pumping wealth into the towns, yet also lack any people of high enough rank to really count as upper class. Much like the earliest agricultural societies, the upper class of rural Australia are barely even separated from the other groups in this ear dinky society. And although they often exist exert their influence through the chambers of commerce and being the only people honestly remotely interested in local councils yet for some reason still using cheesy tactics to get elected anyway, they can't really be called the ruling class so much as the class that has a two-story house, or in remote Australia's case a house with four or more walls. Middle class. 75% of the pops in a third world backdrop. Now rural Australia has some very weird middle class statistics which just like when people first heard about stagflation appears quite contradictory. 75% of those who live in rural and remote towns are middle class yet staggeringly live in what appears to be a developing world environment. As much as the palm oil of their smoko Kit Kats does come from the jungle of Borneo, the trans fats from the Mrs. Max pies, rest in peace by the way, does not. That's to say they have access to the wonderful first world nation food that really does not belong in the first world of Mrs. Max pies. The privilege of eating them does not befall the people of rural Indonesia by any stretch of the imagination. Though I hear they stuff Milo with so much sugar that it gives the kids the equivalent of a crack addiction. A giant boar. You know how the CIA apparently grow crack in like Afghanistan or whatever? I don't know where I heard that. That is unsubstantiated information. Well, that is our version of that. Selling Milo to Indonesia. The middle class contains the meat and potatoes of rural Australia. Whether you work for the government, such as police officers, the mines, or participate in the few professions required in Australia, such as being the resident doctor, if the town even has one of those. This makeup gives rural Australia an eclectic mixture of extremely poor services and intense isolation. But provided you don't have any overly debilitating chronic conditions, an extremely easygoing existence this is almost an anathema to the city middle existence. You just look upon the faces of any suit wearer and see them stricken with enough worry and fear that you begin to believe that the world is run by lizard people who keep their underlings in line by threatening to lay eggs in their eyeballs. Of course, with furries being the suspiciously wealthy middle class, they're not actually scared of getting eggs laid in their eyeballs, they're likely scared of not getting eggs in their eyeballs. A very specific but necessary fetish to keep the world going round. Ah, the delicate balance of economic ecosystems. I admire anyone who goes into research the great and wonderful science of economics in school and for some reason exclusively want to debate with me about how great nuclear power is. Here is the difference between the rural middle class and the city middle class. In the city middle class you have a really nice smile, fine combed hair, and your life is utterly stressful to the point of misery. In the rural middle class, your teeth are rotten because unbeknownst to you, the cages of the Great Northern Beer has a high sugar content. You're both boldened and frizzled in a way that somehow makes a cool mullet, and your life is full of so many she'll be rights and too easy. To the point where I'm pretty sure you'd witness a Martian invasion and go, Ah, oh, those aenies got bigger and decided to invade from the sky, eh? Ah oh, mate, no drama, let me just sing a few beers and I'll deal with it. No doubt they'll succeed too, because the average rural Australian's teeth is full of so many microbes, it would cause a mass epidemic in those extraterrestrial machines with a single flash of that classy Aussie troll smile. This is not to say they're dirty. Good hygiene is a habit of most all Australians, except in the remotest communities where the dirt would stick to you either way. <laughs> and water is best preserved. The thing they call dry towns because they had been alcohol in there. Nah, mate. Plenty of alcohol there, trust me. <laughs> Which is what makes it more amazing that rural Australians are able to still look so goddamn filthy. 
Of course, that's mostly when talking about rural working class Australians, just like with high school, there's many different variations and exceptions. If we look at things in more controlled manners, rural and city tradies might have a more similar attitude than rural tradies and city yuppies. And rural public servants and city yuppies might share a presentability compared to their tradie counterparts. Needless to say, a city tradie will look cleaner than a country tradie, but be just as clean and a city businessman will look busier than a country pumpkin in the Shire building. Much like studies into psychological problems or the contradictory relationships between quantum mechanics and relativity theory, it is a very multifaceted subject that requires years of study to fully understand with many aspects that seem at odds with each other. One such factor includes Davo and Darren, who will likely have a punch up at the pub before their first beer. At least sink one in first, guys. No Estrada. Providing the rural Australian version of menial labour, mumbling incoherently in public places. Now for the proles. Called as such because there's a good chance they're on parole. Just as the Statue of Liberty says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores. The statues of rural Australia like the Dongra Big Lobster, the Goldburn Big Sheep, or the John Crystal Ball. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Give me your mess, your weed, your jar of unleaded 91. You need to be breathed freely. The wretched refuse of your frankly not teeming shores. Rural Australia, unlike the early United States, is less a beacon of liberty and more an array of dropped pins which someone has put a magnet to and now only contains pins too rusty and stubborn to leave. So many good eggs have left to the city the second they've had the chance and so all that is left are our thoroughly boiled ones. That is not to say everyone in rural Australia is a drugger, though in some towns it might very well be the case. I'm looking at you. Mundabindi, I assume that's a place that exists, I made that up. But anyone who shows the capacity to refrain from excessive use and some that don't are all elevated to that high paying mining job which leaves the few that do not qualify a really rancid mess. I would like to clarify that if you fit in this category I am not saying you personally are a rants. In fact, I already know that you are a bloody legend for watching this and going on yet. I'm simply saying that you're not the CEO of anything other than dropping fat cones. That or you're on meth, in which case, don't do that. You're being naughty. Stop it. This is also where I would place the minimum wage workers, which are the surprisingly sizable quantity of people too drug fucked to work on high paying worker jobs and yet no one near fried enough to work as a fryer at their local chicken trait slash henny penny. Regional dialects. One of my favourite stories I heard from someone back in my service industry days of What's this? Just over a year ago! Wow, time flies! Was one of my co-workers talking about how they got fired from Hungry Jack's because they turned the cool room into a hot box. And only after the manager checked on the place because no one was getting served did they get fired. Though I suppose they were already quite blazed. Apparently it was not the first time they did it either. It took multiple attempts of blatantly using drugs on site before something happened. Oh, it's not weed smoke, it's steam from all those steamed Angus hands you're having. Mmm, -mm. can't wait for the famous Hungry Jack's Angus steamed ham whoppers. Steamed hams are better at Hungry Jack's. What do you reckon everyone got really into that Rebel Whopper because the weed smoke got into the patty so people took one bite and was like, I'm mad hungry bro, let's get another. Wage cucks are often kept at the bare minimum in rural Australia, making sure the surveys and shopping centres are open for the main workers and that's about it. Not much else is able to survive. What does is often quite coveted. It's amazing how much of a drug problem rural Australia has. It's to the point where the main reply to this video, if it ever reaches a rural population, would be Drug problem? I don't have a drug problem. I'm great at doing drugs. Oi, Roy, watch me vortex this beer. <laughs> oh no. Beer before bong when you're in the room. Oh man, I'm getting high just thinking about it, eh? Don't do drugs, kids. It's bad for you. 
So, my syndicalist comrades slash entrepreneurial patriots, this is the class structure of the Australian rural society, full of weird contradictions. To quote Lenin, and this is a real quote, naturally, when rural Australia is finally developed and consolidated as an independent capitalist state, chicken treat, the condition of the workers will change, chicken treat. Once we get more chicken treat, rural Australia conditions will change. That is what Lenin's real motivation for the new economic policy was. He wanted to invent chicken treat. Such a shame he died before he could realise his dream. All jokes aside, rural Australia is a legitimately amicable place to live. If you are a person with a purpose, you can really make something of yourself here. There is no better time in world history to live in the backwater of the world. Given the age of near complete internet access gives you the ability to learn and produce anywhere, there are still drawbacks, sure, but you can legitimately weigh up your options. And I think that this opportunity needs to be taken advantage of. For too long have the rural population been exploited. Rurals of the world unite. All we have to lose are our chains. And unrestricted access to the only public toilet in town.